So um, when we decided to um, have a focus on media literacy research um, across the three sites of uh, Brisbane, Canberra and Sydney um, to, to launch our media literacy report, um, I tried to really think through how we could represent media literacy on a panel. Because media literacy means so many different things to so many different people. It has so many different kinds of functions and purposes. And so the, um, the title of the panel is Media Literacy's Many Tasks, Promoting Critical Engagement with Digital Platforms. Um, and so I suppose it's that key aspect of promoting critical engagement and promoting um, civic participation, as Paul was talking about this morning, through digital platforms um, in, in fair and in critically reflective ways um, that really ties together the kinds of things that our panellists will say this afternoon. But I, I really want to emphasise the point that media literacy really is a diverse set of activities. It's not just one kind of thing that we can easily define and say, this is it. Um, and increasingly, media literacy gets called upon to um, solve um, more and more complex problems related to the media and digital platforms. Um, and more and more people in various parts of society are being asked to try to solve those problems as well. Um, so certainly teachers in schools are being asked to promote media literacy and, and teach media education. Uh, but people in libraries, for instance, are increasingly being asked to um, program activities that relate to media literacy and media education. Um, the media companies themselves, I think, uh, are being pressured to find ways to help people to reflect critically on the media, even as they don't always behave in ways that um, are conducive to media literacy. So um, it's a complex area that we're talking about, and I'm really confident that the five speakers that we have today um, are going to canvas a whole range of, of issues related to media literacy that um, will enable us to have a really robust discussion in the second part of this um, panel today. So I want to begin by welcoming um, Anne Kruger, um, who's going to speak about first drafts vaccine misinformation hub and dashboard for media literacy. And Anne Kruger is um, First Draft APAC director. She launched First Draft in Sydney in 2019 and soon expanded operations into the Asia Pacific region. The team's work is published daily in First Draft's newly launched Vaccine Insights Hub, as well as in First Draft's daily newsletters. So I'd like to welcome Anne to speak to you. Thanks very much for that. Well, thanks very much for the um, introduction, Michael, and um, it's really good to be here today. And I just want to explain a little bit about First Draft for those of you that might not be as familiar with us. Um, we really focus on misinformation and, and the harm that this is having on communities. And in particular, we look at diverse communities and are really interested in, you know, who, would, who is targeted by misinformation and disinformation. We have a network called Crosscheck, which basically um, gives us access to journalists right across Australia and now APAC. And we also um, link in with our bureaus in the UK and the US. And uh, we have daily conversations with, with the journalists there. And so we're monitoring, we're doing a lot with verification. We don't sort of tend to just publish individual fact checks because we take a bit more of a multi-pronged whole of society, look at what we're doing. But we did spend the, um, certainly the start of the pandemic, really um, training up journalists saying, please be careful about the headlines that you're writing because this is all that people are going to read and then they're going to put their angry emojis on or they're gonna share it. Um, you know, please be careful, don't to repeat the myths and down, you know, 500 words later, we actually see the explanation. So we spent a lot of time doing that to begin with. Um, but I'm really coming today, and I loved how you explained about the different um, definitions and approaches to media literacy. I have a very strong news literacy lens, if you like, um, with the larger media literacy framework. Um, and I've, 
started there with a, a photo of myself just to embarrass myself. So this was um, back at um, CNN in Hong Kong. So at the end of 2002, there were actually murmurings from across the border of mainland China that there were um, these symptoms of, you know, pneumonia-like symptoms that people were having. And of course, we know now that that became known as SARS. Now, we didn't have um, the smartphones, as we saw um, with the time-lapse presentation earlier this morning. We didn't have smartphones. You know, the social networks weren't quite what they were. But we were still seeing misinformation. So people still had texts. People had, still had mobile phones. And they were texting each other. And this was the start of what I see now as the home remedies. So it was like, take up cigarette smoking, have the smoke around so that, you know, it will ward off this disease. Um, we were seeing questions about governments and, um, you know, how much can we trust the governments and, and the, um, you know, politicians. And, and I sort of look at that and I think, you know, if you take away the misinformation, people have actually got legitimate questions. They want to know about their safety. They want to know what is the government doing about this. Now, we were, um, you know, at CNN. So at that time, it was a slightly different time in history too, I guess, when you think about the politics of Hong Kong. But the Hong Kong government were very keen to get on TV and very keen to, um, you know, send people from the health department to speak to us, to look like they are in control. Okay. So just think of all the media literacy aspects that that, that brings into it into things. Um, so I was quite thrilled to um, be involved with the, um, the first draft research that um, actually um, was spoken about earlier by Paul um, that was really looking at, well, you know, what's the wider framework here now that we're talking about this pandemic? Um, what are the likely questions that people are going to have? What are the likely targets, um, uh, you know, that agents of misinformation, or I should say disinformation, who are they targeting, what communities, what's their agenda, um, what do we need to be aware of when we think about, um, you know, really serving the community. So we were quite involved with this large scale research. Um, first draft is based at the Centre for Media Transition at UTS in uh, Sydney. I work um, remotely here from Brisbane. Uh, normally I'm travelling around Asia, but that's, that's not happening at the moment. Um, but anyway, so so they approached us, the, the US team approached us and said, can you set up a research framework so that we can do this from a, you know, a methodological point of view and uh, make this quite rigorous. So um, we were really looking at, you know, what are the different narratives? What can we expect as the vaccines are being developed? What can we expect with the rollout? What things do we need to be um, aware of? So we set up the framework. We um, individually coded. Uh, we looked at 1,200 posts across Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook pages, Facebook groups in English, Spanish, and French. And, you know, it was quite, um, uh, I guess, labor intensive that way too, but very interesting, the things that we found. Um, so we saw a little bit this morning about these, you know, main buckets of um, uh, different um, discourse. The first two that I want to focus on are really um, political and economic and safety and efficacy, because these were the strongest narratives that were coming out of our research. Um, and just think about, you know, we've been looking at Papua New Guinea recently been looking at the changes in the headlines we're seeing here in Australia with AstraZeneca and Pfizer. Okay, so it, we see, you know, the political and economic motives coming in. You know, why should we trust these governments in Papua New Guinea? You know, it's geopolitics as well. It's safety, it's efficacy. But it's also within a local um, context as well. So with Papua New Guinea, you're looking at, um, in, you know, sorcery and torture in the local context there and that mix of misinformation. Interesting, um, if you go along the spectrum here, uh, we found that in English speaking communities, liberty and freedom were quite popular narratives, but not so much in the um, Spanish communities. So um, as I mentioned, you know, I very much look at this from a um, uh, news literacy point of view. Um, another thing that we're doing at First Draft is um, looking at media literacy for adults. And we launched this text message SMS course during the US elections. It was really just a bit of a experiment. And um, we were quite surprised at the uptake in that course and the interest in that course. And so now we're literally at the point where we are signing some um, contracts and we're about to launch that in APAC as well. 
So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but that news literacy perspective, I think, is important for people to understand, well, you know, what is journalism and how is that different to the propaganda, to PR, to marketing, to entertainment? Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, and even activism, it doesn't mean that those things are bad. We just need to know what's the goal of uh, journalism compared to the goal of propaganda, the goal of marketing and, and entertainment. And we need to think about, well, what is the journalism that can deliver the information to answer those legitimate questions that people have? Because most people don't have time to sift through, right, here's the government website, here's the Atagi information, and piece that all together, and um, realise when someone's targeting them with misinformation and disinformation. So we need to think about, um, you know, what is news? And so often we see in Australia that um, there's a lot of TV programs with news in it or look like a news desk, but they're giving opinion. They're giving a, um, you know, an agenda, depending on, you know, um, who's, be who's behind the organisation. Um, so that's an area that, um, you know, I feel quite strongly about that we have to get that sorted with adults. And then we've got a better chance to, um, you know, protect them from deception when it comes to misinformation and disinformation and think about the different um, motives of, of agents of disinformation. So just to um, end with, um, we were also involved with, I was the co-chief investigator um, for the disinformation code that um, was just accepted by the ACMA. So that was, um, 2020 was a, a you know, pretty busy year <laughs> for me. Um, but it was a, a very iterative process and I was really pleased to see that, you know, we, we made a lot of progress there, but I think there's still a little bit more to go when it comes to, there's an element there for media literacy. Objective four talks about digital literacy. And I would really like to see as this, um, you know, code is further, um, you know, implemented, I would really like to see um, some pressure on that digital literacy because I see that as the framework. And I can tell you that there is interest from uh, from the platforms to do this. There's interest um, from media organisations to do this. So going forward, um, you know, that's something that, um, you know, feel free to keep an eye out and hold people to account as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anne. Uh, so our next speaker is um, Axel Bruns, Professor Axel Bruns, um, and his um, talk is uh, Media Literacy After Dark, How Hyperpartisans hyper Pervert Critical Engagement. Um, Axel Bruns is a professor in the Digital Media Research Centre and a chief investigator in the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. His books include Are Filter Bub Bubbles Real? Um, and gatekeep, uh, gate watching and use creation, curation, journalism, social media, and the public sphere, sphere. Okay, thanks, Axel. All right, thank you very much, and it's it's great to be here and, and uh, talk about these really important issues. Um, I don't have any slides, so uh, I'll, I'll just stand in front of the the lectern here. Um, look, there's there's so many things to do with media literacy um, that we could talk about. Uh, I could say quite a bit about data literacy as well, um, the uh, the way that users of social media platforms in particular are engaging with, uh, with the data that they share with these platforms, the understandings that they have of what they're sharing and where that data goes. But I'll actually continue in, in the vein that Anne started and talk also about news aspects of media literacy, of digital literacy, because I think that at the moment is obviously one of the, the most pressing issues that we're, that we're facing. Um, I'm a media and communications researcher. Um, I study public communication, particularly on social media platforms. Um, and uh, that has meant for the last year or so, certainly, but also for some time before that, actually, um, dealing particularly also with uh, public communication, public debate, public discourse around the pandemic, obviously, and related issues, and more broadly, um, the, the engagement with and sharing of um, mis- and disinformation, what we try no longer to call fake news because that term is so problematic and, and has been so widely misused uh, by so many people, um, but problematic information essentially in, in its various guises, whether that's deliberately shared as disinformation or shared by people who genuinely believe in it as misinformation, which is possibly the more pernicious part even. Um, so. Uh, 
one of the, the things that we've done, for instance, over the last uh, few months is uh, to have a very significant, very detailed look at um, uh, conspiracy theories relating to uh, COVID-19 with a particular focus on conspiracy theories that claim that there is some sort of link between COVID-19 and 5G technology. There isn't, just to be absolutely clear about this, but um, uh, certainly quite a few people have been claiming this and continue to claim it as well. Um, so actually one thing, just following on from what Anne's been talking about part particularly, is that uh, we've seen one of the really key vectors for that kind of uh, false information to, uh, in making its way into mainstream media coverage has been particular elements of journalism that have very limited levels of um, journalistic ethics, uh, shall we say, of, of, of uh, journalistic care. So very often what we've seen is that it's not so much that mainstream you know, hard news publications are actively claiming that there's a link between COVID-19 and 5G. But what we're seeing is that entertainment publications, uh, celebrity uh, publications, uh, sports and uh, other, uh, you know, publications that, that focus on what celebrities of various types are saying, they have been the vectors for these sorts of claims to make their way into mainstream circulation. We've seen that celebrities come out and because they have nothing else to do and they, their literacy is there, uh, in this space aren't actually very good, they make these outlandish claims about links between COVID-19 and 5G. And then we've got celebrity journalism, entertainment journalism, tabloids that end up covering these things with very little critical attention to what's actually being said. They just say, Celebrity X got themselves into trouble or has made a gaffe or is in hot water for making claims about, you know, COVID and 5G. But they then cite exactly what Celebrity X has said. They might even link to the sources that that celebrity has cited themselves. So from that, we are seeing a, a, a massive amplification of these conspiracy theories well beyond their very obscure places of origin. Um, and so at that point, uh, these, these uh, start to circulate much more broadly in the, in the general public, in general public debate. And more and more people are then, you know, resharing, retweeting, uh, re republishing this kind of content as well. Um, we've literally seen some tabloid newspapers online that have included full videos of conspiracy theorists in their coverage of these conspiracy theories. And that's obviously deeply, deeply problematic for the dissemin dissemination of that sort of content. Um, so when we talk about the, I guess, the critical literacies of, of journalists in the first place as well, their, their understanding of um, the impact of their coverage. Um, I think we really also have to be, be looking very carefully at those journalists that are not normally covering health news, pandemic news, political news, whatever it is, but that are simply essentially stenographers for celebrities. Um, because that's really, I think, the, 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 the soft underbelly, the weak link in the chain of journalism. From there, these kinds of claims make, make their way into broader coverage. Um, and then we get to a point where, where uh, politicians and others have to respond to them and suddenly we've got a big debate about whatever links there are supposed to be between COVID-19 and 5G or other uh, pandemic mis and disinformation for that matter. Um, so that's, that's just really something that, that this prompted for me, this, this question of how we improve the, I guess, the critical literacies of, of journalists themselves in the first place. Um, but more broadly too, and, and I think this came out a little bit from what Anne's been saying as well. Um, what I'm seeing also with these kinds of conspiracy groups in the first place and more broadly with, uh, with others that are pushing um, divergent views basically on the pandemic and on other topics for that matter as well, this is obviously not, linked, uh, not, not limited just to the pandemic, um, is that increasingly also there is a kind of weaponization of media literacy with some of these groups as well. Um, in the same way, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't mean this in any way as criticism, but in the same way in the sense that First Draft is, is trying to help journalists to, to, to work out what's true and what's not, and is trying to help the general public to, to work out what's true and what's not, by, by pointing out when something might appear like a news story, might, might appear like a reliable news channel or whatever, um, by, by giving them the literacies to understand that just because something looks like a news report doesn't mean that it is one. Just because something looks like it's expressed in the way of a, of a news story doesn't mean it's, it's properly researched and backed up by the evidence. Um, these conspiracist groups and these other fringe 
actors that are trying to push some alternative narrative, some alternative facts, as, as Kelly and Conway, Conway might say, um, these kinds of groups on the fringes are doing much the same for their audiences as well, just with different targets. So in the same way that um, any of us might say, well, don't trust this story becomes, because it comes from some fringe blog that no one's ever heard of before, or it, become, it comes from some hyper-partisan site that is very actively pushing whatever kind of ideological agenda it might represent. These groups will say, well, don't trust this because it comes from the New York Times. Don't trust this because it comes from CNN, and you know what they're like. That's essentially the argument that they're making. So they are using the rhetoric of media literacy, the approaches of media literacy, to sow doubt in their audiences', audiences minds about these mainstream journalistic publications by saying, well, we know they're financed by the global elites and you know globalists and whatever else they might claim they are. Um, we know that they're liberal fake news, of course, in the, in, in the words of Donald Trump. We know that they represent a particular point of view. Um, and in some ways, they do. They represent proper journalism most of the time, and that's not what they like. Um, but essentially, they are using the same, that particular rhetoric of media literacy to push back against this mainstream journalism in much the same way that most of us might use the rhetoric of media literacy to push back against these, these fringe outlets as well. So for me, I think one, one debate that we will have to have um, is how we, I guess, embed, uh, embed morals into media literacy or, or bring those out more. I mean, they're already there, of course, for much of the media literacy, the work that's being done, but how we go beyond just teaching the the principles of questioning, you know, where information comes from and what's what's be, you know who or what is behind a particular set of information, a particular outlet. How we turn that around and actually also make sure that this is not just abused by people who are trying to push some outlandish outlandish fringe agenda, um, you know, in order to further disrupt uh, public debate. So that to me is a, is a really critical question now, and I think something that we should talk more about. Thanks, Axel. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Axel. Um, so shifting gears slightly now to um, um, hear from Minette Montemayor. So uh, Minette's presentation is the state of play of media literacy education in Australian schools. And of course, um, the links between these broader questions of, of how we teach about media literacy and then um, how that gets in, done in a, in a formal curriculum sense in schools is a really crucial one. Um, and Minette's well placed to talk about this. So uh, Minette Montemayor is president of the Queensland chapter of Australian Teachers of Media. Um, she is currently co-chair of the Australian Teachers of Media, that the national organisation, and serves as a board member of the National Advocates for Arts Education, uh, representing media education. Uh, Minette is an experienced media literacy educator and has collaborated with SBS Learn, the Australian Children's Television Foundation and Matchbox, Matchbox Pictures on several education projects. Uh, thanks, Minette. Thanks, Michael. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to be here to um, speak about, I guess, the state of play of media education here in Australia. Um, before I forget this point, I do want to forefront and say that um, media educators uh, come in all shapes um, and sizes. And by that, what I mean is media arts or film television or mass communication, um, that field um, as a teacher can sometimes be your second teaching area. It could be your third teaching area. You could have been given that class um, because the specialists um, weren't available or there. And that's something that I do want to front end. And then we are so lucky to have people come from industry or have educators who have um, media as their first uh, teaching area. But for many of us, it does come as a second um, teaching area or a third one. Um, but I do want to give a little bit of history and context in regards to curriculum. Um, and there was a significant amount of advocacy that happened. And um, I, lo I like that I see Dr. Um, Colin Stewart, who's in the room, he's been there, um, you know, very early on in advocating for arts education, but ensuring that um, media arts is, is recognised and included as a fifth um, arts uh, subject and has a rightful place 
uh, there. And um, when the national curriculum um, was being rolled out and ideated quite early, um, you know, uh, more than a decade ago, um, part of that was ensuring that the arts was recognised as a key learning area. Um, so in some ways, um, media arts or film television is a very young subject in comparison to other subjects, um, but it's a very exciting one. And I do want to recognise just a bit of the history um, that's come up as a result of that. So between 2009, 2015, um, that was the development of draft curriculum consultation and early implementation. And I um, know that Colin, Michael, uh, Roger Dunscombe and Derek Weeks um, played a lot in that space to ensure that um, media arts and the arts were included. Um, most excitingly was then that five arts subjects um, formed the key learning area of the arts and we started to see this uh, implemented across uh, the country. Um, Mid-2020, um, an Australian uh, curriculum review um, started, so after uh, the um, Education Council came together and decided there needs to be a review, but it is not a rewrite. So it is to refine, update and declutter. You can imagine when writers started writing about, say, media arts, there's a lot that's changed um, quite evidently. Um, so there's some updates that need to occur there. Um, and then we should see um, a website go live with um, the updates in there. So that's slated for 2022. Um, and obviously, um, everyone's well placed to provide some feedback during the consultation um, that will occur. I think it starts uh, in April. Um, in terms of the Australian curriculum, and this is a foundation or prep to year 10 curriculum, it has three facets to it. That is the eight key learning areas. Um, there are three cross-curriculum priorities, so sustainability, Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, histories and cultures. But the interesting thing here is the seven general capabilities. Um, in the senior space, it's known as the 21st century um, skills. So I like to just call them, um, and it's quite often we just call them the essential skills. Um, but I do have a provocation here, which is should media literacy or can it be an eighth general capability? I would argue yes, um, but then if so, what does that, how does that impact media arts? So just something to think about there. Um, I can speak quite confidently about uh, how uh, film television and new media or media arts and practice um, is applied, that curriculum is applied here in Queensland. Um, and we underwent um, significant changes in the schooling system for our senior space. Um, previous to this 2019 version, um, the last syllabus document uh, was created in 2005. Um, so we didn't um, get a rewrite or update in that. However, it was written in a way that was quite future proofing. Um, so teachers still had agency to include social media um, and changes that um, occurred uh, within that curriculum. Something that I'd like to um, point out is this idea of participatory media. Um, and one of the assessments being multi-platform, um, a multi-platform product. And that was something that caused quite a bit of anxiety among teachers in terms of teaching um, that form of storytelling or engaging in social media spaces. And that was something that was future-proofing this um, curriculum, um, but did cause quite a bit of anxiety because um, unless you knew Henry Jenkins' work or you were familiar with the work that the DMRC are doing, it is a scary space to, to um, look into. Um, and even last year, we had a panel um, that was about TikTok and that just changed a lot of uh, media teachers' perspectives. And then we also have media arts in practice. Um, so there, I guess, media um, communications and media in society um, are quite um, relevant. Um, the Australian Teachers of Media um, is comprised of state chapters and territories, but again, we are a relatively young, um, I guess, association in comparison to our colleagues in drama, dance, music um, and visual art. Um, uh, Atom, Victoria, Queensland and um, Western Australia, uh, we're quite well established um, and we support primary and uh, secondary um, educators. 
But quite excitingly, um, last year I supported um, Northern Territory teachers to um, create Atom NT, so that's really exciting for us. And my colleague uh, Roger um, and Brad uh, from WA supported Atom SA. So that's very exciting for us to continue to expand um, a national presence, but ensure that there is professional learning happening uh, in, in those um, respective states and territories. And you might be familiar with Atom Publishing who run Atom Awards, the Atom Study Guides, um, which we have here, and that um, works out of and operates out of Atom Victoria. In terms of the state of play of media literacy uh, in Australian schools, um, media arts, so that's the ACARA um, curriculum, it's implemented across all states and territories except for New South Wales, and that's a story for another time. Um, however, we are starting conversations with NESA about um, media arts happening in New South Wales. Senior courses are offered in Victoria, Queensland, WA, SA, Tasmania, and ACT, but they take a they all take very different um, shapes and courses. So that may be certificate courses, um, or it might be like our general syllabus. Um, and the implementation of media arts in primary school and high schools is varied. This has to do with resourcing, um, because to produce products, you need um, physical resources, you need access to technology. It also comes back to what I mentioned earlier um, on, is that um, specialists in-field knowledge or teachers who are keen to um, develop um, their skills and knowledge base in there. And that's particularly challenging in primary um, sectors where generalist teachers have so much curriculum that they do need to teach, um, but there are really great pockets um, of practice that are happening. Um, and you, quite often arts specialists have a performing arts background. Um, but again, we do have teachers who then take on media arts as a second or third specialist area. What I do want to recognise is the use of mobile devices and how this has certainly enabled teachers um, and schools to take on media arts or film and television. Given that you have that tool um, handy um, and students, if the school enables mobile phones to be used at schools, can then start producing work, can start accessing um, social media platforms to then have a look at hashtags or even start conversations around big data or algorithmic culture. So that has absolutely changed how we um, are able to teach in our class and implement curriculum. Um, there are also aspects of media literacy um, that appear in English design and digital technologies. So there, as Michael said, there's media literacy is so large, there's so many tasks. And you'll see when you go to the, those curriculum documents, aspects of media literacy. Um, when we talk about senior and junior or even primary media um, studies or media arts, there is uh, five underpinning key concepts um, and that forms the acronym TRAIL. So these key concepts are technologies, representations, audiences, institutions, and languages or media languages. This enables us as teachers to kind of narrow, I guess, the um, focus of uh, the content that we are teaching. Um, and with this uh, new or next iteration of media arts, there is a proposal for a sixth key concept being relationships. And that's, I guess, the play, um, place where media literacy um, plays in quite a bit. Um, but uh, uh, another provocation there is, is, is relationships the best word? Um, is it connectivity or participation, perhaps? Um, this is a photo from 2016 from the last Atom uh, National Conference. Um, you might notice Michael there in the shadows. So. <laughs> I think that may have been after maybe watching some election happening at the time. <laughs> Um, and the other question that Michael asked um, of us and the panellists was what our role is in media literacy. So I wear a number of hats there, um, but my main goal is in terms of advocacy. So making sure that um, the integrity of media arts and film television is there in the curriculum um, and that it has a valued place um, within, within the landscape of curriculum. Um, quite often I uh, get to actively work in a cons um, consultation um, space, either with industry and organisations, um, but also with curriculum authorities. 
um, and uh, also assist in ensuring that professional learning uh, is available for pre-service primary, secondary and tertiary educators, um, and then also developing educational resources uh, and also supporting other subject associations. So ensuring that we are collaborative and working together and supporting state and territory uh, chapters. A big couple highlights um, there. Okay, so where to from here? Um, mobile devices, as I said, is a huge game changer. And I see that with my niece, and this is her um, screenshot of what her access is and what she's using. I'm con constantly reminded by her how irrelevant I've become and how I use my own social media platforms. Um, but she's not too much different to the students that I teach in my classroom. And so we have, as, a, as teachers, we have a duty of care to ensure that we are um, teaching media literate um, young people. So part of that is when you have a mobile device, you have access, you're consuming information, and you become a content producer. She doesn't have media arts um, explicitly in her school, um, but when I watched her TikTok videos, I was amazed by her editing skills, and that was self-taught. Um, and then I started to think, oh no, I'm irrelevant as a teacher. <laughs> I was looking forward to making movies, but she doesn't need me. Um, so some questions here is, can we ensure that young people are equipped to, like in history subjects, evaluate information of primary and secondary sources before believing influencers and micro celebrities? And that's for me a, a, a very real, um, I guess, uh, question and reality because quite often students will challenge me but then I want to know where they've received their information and and what what and you know whether or not they understand what they're consuming um, and the other side to that is how do we educate parents and how how do we educate adults and this program is really exciting for me because quite often parents ask what do you, what age do you think I should give my child a mobile device when do you think they should have social media as a teacher, I don't have any say in that, um, but we do need to give um, parents professional learning like teachers about how they can enable their students or their young people to have access, but to use that tool um, productively um, and not negatively or have a negative impact um, on their young person. I'll give you some time to read this here because I think it really summarises um, the media education landscape. So I think we're at a really, um, I guess, exciting point in terms of media literacy. Um, it is a really big topic, um, but teachers and young people and their parents are curious to know what can they do so that they become active, ethical citizens. Um, and I'm really excited for this research and um, really keen to see what the outcomes are and see how we can leverage the collective wisdom within this room and all of the other spaces um, to help our educators um, and parents and young people become those active digital citizens. Thanks so much, Manette. And um, look, that um, connection into schools is obviously such a crucial one in relation to how media literacy education occurs in Australia and all of those questions around, you know, how do we educate teachers um, to be across the, the latest and greatest information related to digital media is really, um, is really crucial as well. Um, and it's, nice, it's a nice segue in some respects to the next uh, speaker, um, Alicia Rodriguez who's going to be um, speaking about um, TikTok, thinking through TikTok, a framework for platform literacy. And, um, and this is exactly the kind of, um, of area of knowledge that is emerging. It's emerging through the, the research of, of um, our researchers in the DMRC, through um, the work of people like uh, Alicia and Bondi Kay. Um, and it's exactly the kind of knowledge that needs to be translated so that teachers can get at it and, and uh, and can then pass it on to their students as well. But um, so, Alicia Rodriguez is a PhD student in uh, the D Digital Media Research Centre at, at QUT. 
Her PhD explores how TELS's big battery was, what was uh, the world's biggest lithium ion battery, mediates new kinds of socio-technical relations about Australia's energy future. Alicia, Alicia's broader research agenda examines public communication on digital platforms to explore how people and technology mutually and dynamically shape each other. Thanks, Michael. So I think that last part of my introduction just sums up that I like to think about technology and I like to think about mundane technology. So uh, some of the things that I've, I've looked at um, includes the battery icon on our phones. And I think about how the battery icon, as it depletes, creates an affective response in the way that, let's say, you need to send that text message or add, put that tweet out there. Seeing that battery icon deplete might make you not proofread or send it out. Um, or you might choose not to watch that Netflix video on the, the train ride home because you know you have to make that phone call later on. So thinking about how technologies are shaping society. I also then think about that in terms of on platforms. So other research I've done is looking at the upvote, downvote feature on Reddit uh, and looking at how Redditors talk about this feature um, and how they make sense of it through their practices. And one of the things that comes out for that is that even though the platform says that you upvote you know, things that, that you think should be more visible and you downvote things that you don't think should be more visible and that they're two sides of the same coin. In practice, they're actually two sides of two different coins um, and they're treated differently uh, by Redditors. I also think about it in terms of on TikTok, um, I've done some research looking at the use this sound feature and the ways that uh, people want to have their audio um, properly attributed on the platform, rightly so, understandably so. Um, and we explore the ways that um, users circumvent the platform features or utilize the platform features like hashtags or video text to actually provide credit when that credit hasn't been provided through the platform features themselves, like they use this sound. Um, so yeah, I think a lot about technology and the way that it shapes people and how people then shape um, society. So I'll put some provocations out there in terms of with media technologies. So this idea that media technology is society made durable, well, what do I mean by this? Well, I want you to imagine uh, sitting on a park bench and a stranger comes along and sits beside you and you start having a personal conversation and then you part ways and now that conversation only exists in terms of the two, yourself and that other person. It will live on in our memories, but there's no record that, thing, that this has taken place. Now, through social media, uh, we're able to make these interactions or these interactions made durable. They have a, a permanence to them. They're now searchable and scalable. Um, and so what's important here to think about is that the broader societal ills or the broader societal joys, um, these things are made durable through these technologies. And so folks like myself, like a researcher, a digital media researcher, can come along and analyze these things. Um, so the other thing that I want to put out there to think about is how media technologies are social engines. They co-create what we experience as the social. We wouldn't be able to have these interactions um, on these platforms without these platform features being there. And in doing so, they enable and they both enable and constrain particular types of uh, interactions to take place. So they are um, actively shaping what we can do. So let me now take this kind of abstract ideas and apply it to a concrete case study. So um, this is the Mrs. Uh, Kelly. Um, she has 1.3 million followers on TikTok and she's a math teacher in the States. Um, and so this is just one of the videos that you might come across on the For You page on TikTok, which is the uh, automatic uh, recommended feed that's shown to people. Um, so I want you to think about this in terms of the content and the society side of it the things that we see, so what is in the video content, or the comments, or the text meaning. Or we can, look at we can ask questions like what identities are or are not being represented in the content of the video. So this is, society, this is the social that's happening. But this is all made possible through the platform. So everything in red can be thought of as the platform features. So we've got uh, the video reply, we've got video editing, there are filters, features, hashtags, there's the use the sound, we can share things, like things, follow. So it's all of these platform features that allow us to engage with or to create 
or to uh, craft the social thing that's taking place on the platform. Um, so to underscore this point that we can think about how TikTok users shape TikTok, the experience of the media technology, as much as TikTok, the media technology shapes them. And with this, we can start asking some um, critical questions for media literacy. And these might include things so, like this question, how do users shape the experience of TikTok? Well, what types of comments do users leave under videos? Are they supportive? Are they bullying? Are emojis used to communicate? And what meaning is being produced? We can also ask this question of what types of content? Is a political critique, humor, dance challenges? Or what identities are being seen? Are they are folks from the LGBTIQ plus community? Do we have indigenous uh, youths represented? Are they uh, beauty influencers? And asking this really important question of who is seen and who is not seen. Um, and the other questions I think that this all then relates to is this, um, how might recommended content to each user's unique feed, the FYP, the For You page, influence their experience of TikTok and more broadly, their understandings not only about the world, but their world. And this then works hand in hand in terms of the actual platform itself. So how does TikTok shape user experiences? Well, we can ask questions like, what types of video creation tools does TikTok provide for users to create content? And what type of creativity does this afford or constrain? Because it, we have to recognize that it's, it's limited. Um, there are only certain things that can be done on the platform itself. Um, we can also ask in what ways does TikTok make it easy or hard to find the original artist or author of a, uh, of a sound or trend within the platform to make sure that uh, proper attribution is taking place. And this question of how might showing the like, comment, share count affect user opinion about a video. If we see a, a video with a million likes, are we wanting to jump on that train and say, well, it must be good. There's a million other people who like it. Uh, or do we stop and think critically, well, who's being represented here? Is this, is this representing the society that I'm a part of or a society that I want to be a part of? Um, and thinking through that specifically on, well, very prominent on TikTok because it is very algorithmic based in terms of what content is being pushed. It's a relational process between you and the collective society and the platform. It is a triad between these things that are taking place at all times to push that content to you. Um, so. Mine's a bit of a short talk, um, but uh, just kind of finishing off by saying that media technology shapes society as much as just society shapes media technologies. So in terms of thinking this question of digital, like media literacy, getting folks to think about how we all play an active role in what we are seeing or what we are producing or what is yeah, taking place um, on digital media platforms and thinking about how technology doesn't exist within a vacuum um, and that it co-creates the society that we live in. Thanks, Alicia. And then um, moving along now to um, Dr. TJ Thompson, who's um, now going to talk about a different platform, um, Instagram. Um, and, and like Alicia's um, presentation, TJ's is going to um, look at some of the um, specificity around Instagram. Um, so, ready to go. Um, so Dr. TJ Thompson is a senior lecturer in visual communication and media and a chief investigator in the QUT Digital Media Research Center. Um, he recently published to be seen to, to see and be seen the environments, interactions and identities behind news images, which was the winner of the NCA 2020 Diane S. Hope Book of the Year Award um, and is the 2019 Anne Dunn Scholar, Scholar of the Year. TJ's research focuses on how visual journalism is produced, by whom, in what environments, through which processes and with what results. He also examine, examines visual self-representation on social media and everyday image making. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all for being here. So as humans, we are all very highly visual as a species. And um, in a digital media environment, we're also operating and living in a very highly visual digital media environment. But as scholars and academics, we have a really long history of being quite logocentric and caring a bit more about words than about images. And so my research tries to recognize this and tries to focus on the kind of broad umbrella that is visual communication. As Michael alluded to with that bio, looking at questions of if you're out there as a journalist working in an environment that is, say, a gendered environment or a raced environment or a classed environment, 
how does those how do those attributes of the environment impact the interactions that can take place between the journalist and the person represented, and how does that in, in, then inform and shape the depictions and representations that are created? So we've all chatted about how slippery and amorphous media literacy can be as a term. I'll offer a, a definition here. I think of media literacy as about being how people access, evaluate, create, or alter media. And a lot of my research looks at how visual media in particular are created, edited, and shared. But today I'm going to focus a little bit with the study I'll present on how a visual media are engaged with and accessed. So a bit more specifically, the study I'll share with you was conducted a few years ago in the States, and it explores how people in the States engage with news images on Instagram. We're trying to, with this research, understand that really interesting question of why do some images, some posts on Instagram get heaps and heaps of likes? and some are pretty much just ignored. So to do so, my co-author and I used the Q method, and we developed for ourselves what's called a concourse. We tried to get a diverse collection of content creators. So we have the top six um, most visited news websites by Alexa Traffic there on the very left. We have some wire services and agencies in the middle. We have the uh, visual journalists who are at the top of their field, people who have won Pulitzer Prizes and Press, uh, World Press Photo Awards. And then we also try to also include um, content from the local and regional outlets that, uh, in which the study was conducted. And by doing this, we can hopefully tease out a little bit about, are people caring about these images and these posts and commenting on them or liking them because they're local, because they're recognizable, because they're familiar, they're in that same geographic or cultural context, or because they're attracted to, for example, the pinnacle of the field and the work that a person who's winning a Pulitzer or a World Press Photo uh, Award can achieve with technical skills and aesthetics, that kind of thing. So um, again, the, the Q method, we gave folks these little cards with images on them, 48 different cards that were drawn from the top performing posts from all these different organizations. We asked them to rank these, put these on this inverted pyramid from the least liked on the left to the most likely to actually like and double tap an image on the right of that inverted pyramid. And then we also interviewed them about the top five images on the right and the bottom five images on the left to see really what are the standout features or attributes of these most engaging and least engaging images for the folks in our sample. Now, I don't have time to get into all the, the nitty gritty details, but I'll just give four high level takeaways for now. So first of those is that there's a very kind of um, plastic and, and, and elastic definition of news. You know, some people are thinking about news as being, what did my you know, partner do today? Or what did my you know, auntie do today? Whereas some people are thinking more about news as more kind of the hard, hard hitting investigative journalism. And a lot of kind of social entertainment news was more popular and more likely to be engaged with on the platform of Instagram compared to the more kind of hard hitting investigative news in visual form. Also be aware that we're, we're looking at the study in particular with the content people would actually double tap and like. So even though there could be an image that's resonant or emotional, if it's an image of tragedy or of negative circumstances, some participants were telling us they didn't want to actually like it because they didn't want to kind of promote that negativity, um, even though they do feel you know, kind of badly for the people being depicted. Second kind of takeaway is that um, the fewer people, the fewer the people in the frame, the more the likelihood for engagement. So if you have kind of really wide shots with lots of crowds, and lots of people, it's not as likely to be engaged with as if you have kind of tighter, more intimate framing with a few folks. And then even further, we look for identifiable facial features. We like to see faces in images. And also if we are able to recognize a specific face. So not just saying, yes, I can see that's a picture of a person and I can see they have a face, but to say, hey, I know that person. That's my you know, prime minister or that's my, you know, auntie or whoever it is, having that recognizable facial feature increases engagement. Third finding is that um, sometimes people had content that was watermarked or regrammed, and you have that little indication, visual indication of watermarks or regramming. Participants in the sample didn't like that. They found it a bit too formal, too distracting, unnecessary, or lacking in originality. This especially is true for the kind of wire service things that I think of more as like stock photography. You can get that anywhere, anyone can use that, anyone can see that, that kind of thing. It's not unique, it's not original. I'm not seeing a unique slice, slice of someone's life. And then fourth and finally, a little interesting for this um, group of, of participants is that 
these folks were more likely to engage with still images as compared to video. So videos, important videos, ubiquitous, but on Instagram at least, these folks were saying that there's a time commitment involved and I'm not necessarily going to Instagram to spend a lot of time watching videos. I'm just kind of flicking through it as I'm in the lift. It's a very short kind of dive in, dive out platform. Also being concerned with audio concerns. If you're, if you're in public, if you're on a bus and you don't have headphones, you can't necessarily listen to a video and appreciate it unless it has captions, which I might not, or if you don't have uh, headphones. And then also, interestingly, thinking about history and a little bit back in time, when Instagram was an images only platform and having a bit of nostalgia for those days of Instagram being an images only platform. Whereas now if you're kind of flicking through your feed, you're seeing videos, a lot of the videos you're seeing are sponsored content, advertising posts, that kind of thing. And so there's a bit of a disassociation from that. You're kind of wanting more of the content from your own people you're following, not from the advertisers or the people trying to sponsor and promote their own content. So there's just some very high level quick insights there. If you do want the full study, you can get it at that short link. Um, and I'll just end up by saying, um, just a, a public commendation and word of kudos to Michael, Tanya, Sora, Simon, his colleagues, doing some really critical work on media literacy and doing this work for years, if not decades, really pushing the needle forward. It's so exciting to be able to have this event today, to be able to have the pre-launch today and the actual launch tomorrow. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your colleagues for having us all and for getting us to this point where we can have some really exciting outcomes happen from our conversations on media literacy. Thanks, TJ. <clears throat> so I think we've got time for me to ask um, maybe three questions or so. Um, so I've got some pre-prepared questions that I asked the panel to kind of um, think about before the panel. And, and rather than ask all of you to answer every one of the three questions, I might just kind of um, ask the question and ask if any of you would like to answer it. And if you don't, then I'll, I'll choose one of you. <laughs> um, uh, so there's the three questions, and then after that, there's um, an opportunity, for hopefully for uh, 15 or, or so minutes, um, for questions from the audience. So um, I promised you that um, it would be that the panel would be about media literacy's many tasks, and um, I think you saw from the presentations that media literacy is very much um, a concept that gets applied in a whole host of of different ways, and you know, we can think about it um, at a, a whole range of levels. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's so much more to say. It's, it's almost impossible to think that we would go away from a day like today, you know, having it all sorted. It's, it's really just the, the start of the conversation. Um, but I did want to um, put panellists on, on the spot a little bit um, to try and answer these questions, because I think they do go to, you know, thinking about what some solutions might be or, you know, where the winds can be. So my first question is, um, can you share something that you have been involved with that led to a positive media literacy outcome? Why was it positive and what impact did it have? Um, so would one of you like to volunteer to answer that question? Okay, TJ, thank you. So very briefly, uh, my partner has a mum who's about 60 and a partner who's about 70. And um, the partner who's about 70 is always getting these emails from a colleague, from a brother or relative that are very fantastical emails. And they have these kind of crazy, did you see this kind of you know thing happen on, on, on the television or these little clips of videos and kind of fantastical things happening. At dinner one, one day, he shared one of these videos he'd received with us at the dinner table, and it purported to show um, these two dancers who were supposedly robots at a Disneyland Shanghai event. And he was like, can you believe it? They look so realistic, they look so real, and those are robots. And this was just shared at the dinner table. And um, he asked me, you know, you know, what do you think? And I said, well, it, it, it would be impressive if they were robots, but do we know they're robots? How do you know? And, and so we were able to have a little bit of a conversation. And, and he said, well, how would you find out? And I was able to tell him about Snopes, the website, for fact checking. And just it was a really simple conversation, just a simple little um, thing over the dinner table. But to think about how we verify w what we have in front of us, if it is real or not, that was just a really nice, simple um, attribute that came to mind. Do we, um, thanks, Manette. I think for um, in terms of a media literacy win, um, since stepping into Atom and then I guess moving up in various roles, um, a big goal was to connect with regional, rural and primary educators. Um, and for 
media arts to be implemented um, there. So a big win in the last, I guess, few years with the amazing executive that I work with is that we have been able to um, have membership across all of those sectors and also in uh, representatives from uh, independent schools. So that's, I think, a huge media, media win for us. Um, in terms of media literacy. And I say us because it, it was a huge joint effort and we continue to build on that. So, yeah. Um, uh, bouncing off TJ, so it's not so much with my research, but before starting my PhD, I was a Mac and iOS technician at Apple. Um, and it's, it was really interesting when you do your training at Apple, they talk about, like you're learning all the technical stuff, but they're there to tell you that you're there to repair the relationship between a customer and their device. And it wasn't until I actually started troubleshooting issues that I realized that the, it's easy to fix a phone, it's easy to fix a computer, but it's hard to have someone who comes in distressed because their, their tool, their device, their gateway to access, you know, their friends, family, work, banking, all those things is not working for them in the way that they need it to. Um, and I, you know, the many interactions that have taken place, but like two really jump out of mind in there. And I think that they're an example of these two extremes with like media literacy. So in one instance, I had um, a woman come in and um, she explained to me that um, she just left her husband and she was at a, a women's shelter and she needed help to create an email address because she's never had her own email address before. And we spent hours together in creating an email address and setting up an Apple ID so that she could download her apps. and. At the end of it, she was crying and I was crying. And you know, it was this really beautiful relational process. And I also saw the extreme end of it where, like, uh, for example, one time where this uh, bloke came in and he was absolutely flying off the handle because he had the NRL app and he wanted to project his um, footy onto the like uh, Chromecast, like put it onto the TV, and it just wasn't working. And he was very adamant that it was not the app and it was the iPhone itself that was, it was Apple's fault. And we went through the T's and C's together of this app and it said that it, it's not able to, to be casted onto the TV. And, and in the end, it's all fine. And you know, um, by, by being kind and relational and, and thinking about how this is distressing for them in the moment and how can I um, address it. But yeah, that was um, just a lot of experiences at Apple. And I also think it, talking about, um, I think, Michael, what you saying at the very start in terms of the role of libraries and, and um, having these spaces, I think the role of places like Apple and Optus and Telstra as, as being nodes for the public to come in to ask these technical questions that expand beyond what that service is actually there for, I think that, yeah, there's a role to play for those um, commercial places. Before I move back to Australia, I was teaching a lot of news literacy throughout Asia and Asia Pacific and involved in some programs with UNESCO. And um, we had, at the University of Hong Kong, we'd set up a curriculum that was based on the Stony Brook curriculum of, of news literacy. And I, I think for us, the highlight was really de-Americanizing it. So you're taking it to Asia Pacific and you're showing um, you know, the concepts, but you're, we were involved in a train the trainers program um, you know, with uh, journalists, academics, researchers, civil society groups. And it was just sort of seeing that in excitement and engagement that they had when it was actually their own culture, their own examples that they could um, you know, relate to and, and um, then take back to their own communities that, um, that I saw was particularly um, rewarding. And even just with the large scale study that First Draft did, um, I briefly mentioned that um, different languages have some um, you know, different interests. So there was the uh, area where, you know, um, you know, uh, very much, you know, anti-lockdown narratives were of interest in English communities, but not so much in Spanish. Well, the Spanish communities were actually more interested in, you know, looking at um, the religion and morality side of things. So if you think about a, you know, a Catholic culture, they need to be reassured about certain vaccines and that sort of thing. So that's, that's been, you know, though using those sorts of themes and that, and that understanding. Um, and just from a personal mean point of view. Um, my own son, who's now in university, um, I took great pleasure in telling him that, um, well, you know, PewDiePie gets paid to say those things. Thank you. Um, right. The second question is, and I think we'll have to do the next two questions a little bit more quickly, rather than uh, just, just because I want to give these folks a, a chance to ask questions as well. Um, but. Um, Tell us what you think is the biggest challenge for media literacy in the Australian community. Axel, can I? You haven't spoken, so I'm going to give this one to you. The biggest challenge. 
Thanks, Michael. I think the reason I haven't spoken is that I'm probably just feeling particularly grumpy uh, and, and not getting enough wins, uh, particularly, I think, on the, on the media and journalism side, uh, it seems to me. And maybe that's actually one of those challenges as well. I mean, we're not, we're not in the hyper-polarized kind of environment of the US, for instance, but we do have some challenges in Australia with the ideologicalization of, of journalism to a certain point, um, uh, with uh, a uh, perhaps it's it's simply the pressures of the job, but also in part the the, the lack of I think taking the necessary caution in some of the reporting. I mean the the sort of I, I didn't want to go up against all of these these wonderful positive examples, but I thought I had a win at some point with some of the 5G stuff that we've done when we were invited to speak to uh, Four Corners about that. But then the program that was produced in the end spent a good 15 minutes talking to five anti-5G activists about what their views were and why they thought they were right and what they're doing in Byron Bay, mainly, um, uh, uh, to, to protest against 5G. And that, to me, seemed entirely inappropriate, I'm sorry to say, because it, it gives a space to a, a, a tiny, totally illegitimate minority view um, and puts that on the same level as the scientific evidence and, and, and gives it the significant platform that you know the ABC and Four Corners has. So I think that's a really problematic thing to do. And I, I was uh, frankly quite unhappy with that in the end. Um, but, and this is, not, this is not about Four Corners. It's not necessarily about this particular program. But this is something that we have seen repeated, not just in Australia, but in, but in many other media outlets around the world as well, even in spite of the wonderful work that that, that First Draft is doing and that other, other fact-checking uh, uh, initiatives are doing as well. But we are still seeing so much of this uncritical reporting or sometimes really just stenography of of outlandish claims around the pandemic or whatever else. And that to me is a really significant challenge. And sometimes that's simply done also for the political reasons of the outlet that's doing it or, or the parties that they're trying to support. So that to me is a really significant challenge and something that we will continue to struggle to address, not just in Australia, but internationally as well. So sorry to bring the mood down after all these wonderful <laughs> positive examples, but that to me is a really significant challenge. All right. I've got one, uh, one last question, and uh, anyone can answer it. Um, what is the one thing that would make a big difference to media literacy in Australia? Alicia? I'll have a crack. Um, the thing that I think of when it, having this question is um, bringing it back down to interactions and this relational idea and radical listening and removing like shame from the process of people not understanding things, like creating the culture where it's okay to say like, I don't know what's going on here or yeah, in, in, in interpersonal interactions that you can put your hand up and say, I don't know what's going on or I don't know how to address this and rather than coming from a place of like, you should know how to do this. So I think, yeah, in the interpersonal level, radical listening to, to people's concerns in terms of, and also removing the shame. Um, I'm going to say funding and policy reform. Um, and I say that because when those things happen, then we get to see that implementation in curriculum. So when the fact that we have a national curriculum, excellent. The fact that media arts is recognised as one of the arts KLAs, great. But there's a huge focus on STEM. Why isn't there a massive focus on media literacy? So with this research, I would hope, and I put the challenge out there, that maybe that could be something that then, for us as educators, it gives us support because there is a lack of, there are, there, there are resources, but there could be more. Um, and we can see those effects that happen um, and education is a, is a very slow system um, for change. Um, so, and it starts with policy and research. I think, I think we'll move on to general Q&A then. So is there someone who would like to ask one of the panelists a question? Yes. Colin? Um, Axel, if you don't mind, I was, I was very interested in your comment about media literacy skills being used for crazy and not for good. <laughs> and I wanted to tell you something that happens in my classes very regularly at high school, and then see if you had something 
to say back because what you said sort of provoked a lot of thinking in, in my mind. So at my school, we teach a course on fake news, which we should probably call problematic information now. And um, one of the things is that we thought would be a really good way to actually get people thinking about that is to talk about the moon landing and cons conspiracy theorists who think that the moon landing was fake. Now that's like obviously crazy, right? So we get them to look at, say, the images that people uh, promote and why they say that those images are fake. Like, say, the American flag on the moon and how it stands out and it doesn't drop down and it appears to flutter in what, what could be atmosphere. So maybe the whole thing was done in the studio. So what, what's interesting is we get the kids to go to original sources, they go to NASA, we get them to go to authoritative sources like news, news at the time and listen to the broadcasts and that sort of thing, as well as to research all the conspiracy websites. And then we ask them to evaluate and then to decide personally what do you think was the moon landing a fake. Now, you'd think that would be a no-brainer, but you, do you know like there's probably 40% of those classes will say, looking at all the evidence and I think, as I judge, I think that it probably was a fake and that the whole thing was staged. Now, that is like classic what you're talking about. And these people think they're being really smart. And I have to give them good marks because they, you know, either... <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah, look, that's, that's a really fascinating story, I have to say. It's, it's, and I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm, I'm not even entirely surprised because there is now such a... Uh, an, an attitude of of critique of questioning authoritative sources sometimes purely to be con contrarian perhaps or sometimes just to be to to show yourself to be cleverer than the next person who just believes in all, all of this received knowledge without without questioning it and there is in some ways now in part because of some of these conspiracy groups and others that have, have pushed this so much, there is a, a value almost being placed on being that, that contra contrarian, that outsider, that, that, that person who, who has the opposite view because it makes you seem, I don't know, smarter or just you know, more informed or something. So, so there is a, there's a tendency, I think, just generally, uh, e even in the public, to, to question just for the sake of questioning. Um, which, in some ways, is, is of course not not a bad thing. You know, you sh yes, you sh you should question what you see, and you should have a, have a have a critical mind. I mean, that's what critical literacy is about, after all. But at the same time, there's also a point where where that where you 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 can't just be contrarian for the sake of it. Um, so, I, I guess my again my my takeaway from that, and and something I'm I'm really struggling trying to articulate, I think, is there is a moral and there is possibly even a political dimension to media literacy, I think. Um, it's not simply something that is, um, that, that, that's a, a, a there, there's, it's not simply a technical dimension of, of saying, well, go to the sources, work out what they are and, 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 uh, and, and see, see which one you believe, basically. But I think there is, as we teach media literacy, as we apply media literacy, I think there is a moral dimension to it as well that is trying to lead people to, to you know, t to pursue uh, a, a truth that is also beneficial to society. I don't, I don't quite know how to, how, how, to, how to explain this properly, I think, and I think this is one of the challenges that we're having. But, um, you know, it, yeah, that, that, that example that you're citing, there is precisely that, I think. There is, you know, yes, it's good to teach people these critical skills to judge for themselves and go to the sources and so on. But if in the end they then come out and say, well, the moon landing was probably fake, then something's obviously not going right. And, and we've might maybe taught the critical skills, but without also making sure that they still land on what hopefully we all would agree is the truth. <laughs> so that, that to me is a, is a really significant challenge. And I'm not sure I've got an answer to that at this point, but it's something I think we need to deal with. All right, uh, another question from the audience then. Thanks, Annette. Um, so my question is, um, I guess, in response to the provocation around the Australian curriculum and um, media arts as being part of the cross-curriculum um, prior, or the general capability, sorry, I always call the wrong one. 
So I should out myself, I guess, as a person that spent a lot of my career thinking about English and literacy and attempting to help teacher education students and teachers <coughs> to puzzle the difference between what literacy and English is. And similar to media arts, we've had times where we've been in the language arts, we've been, you know, so we've, we've been labelled different things across time. Um, but now living within the Australian curriculum context, uh, English has a strand which is called literacy, so literacy is language and literature, but literacy is also one of the essential skills or the um, general capabilities. Um, and the effect of that has definitely been to um, muddy that water, you know, in ways that make it quite difficult for teachers, for kids, for parents to understand what's really being talked about there. So I guess my provocation back to you is that there are risks and opportunities, I think, for being a clear discipline, so with strong boundaries, um, but also fitting more within that general capabilities into disciplinary space. So I just wonder if you think there are both risks and opportunities for, for talking in the same ways around media arts. I agree, which is why I put in the, if it, if it does become a um, eighth general capability, um, then there is a risk there in terms of the discipline, but I guess media arts holds its own in terms of it being an art form as well as um, to distinguish itself differently um, to media literacy. Um, but that's, you'd have to look at both um, deeply. And I think maybe it was TJ, you mentioned how there are so many definitions of what media literacy is. And I guess I, I go back to it is such a young space in comparison to other, other disciplines and fields. Um, and there is there's certainly a risk um, in having media literacy as, as its own uh, general capability. Um, and I've had many uh, conversations and debates and discussions with my peers who in the English space um, about how you teach media literacy um, as well. Um, but then seeing opportunities for an inter interdisciplinary approach um, and looking at the, the best of both worlds. Um, so then students still have a taste of media arts if it's not available in their school. Um, so there are certainly risks and it would have to, there needs to be definition there. Similar um, can be said about numeracy and maths um, and the way that in which numeracy is written as a general capability um, and the way that the maths curriculum is written, they go hand in hand, um, that it's quite different. Um, so literacy, numeracy, very much pair with um, respective key learning areas. So that would be, there would be a risk. Um, so I agree there. I mean, I think, um, I, I won't hold up the next question, but um, it's, not it's not uncontroversial that uh, media literacy is within media arts, right? I mean, it's happened for historical reasons because um, media courses in schools have, over the past 20 years or so, um, tended to gravitate towards the arts because that you know the focus is often on media production and so on and you know over time um, there's more been more and more focus on the kind of creative aspects of media and and, and so on and so forth and um, perhaps in some respects arguably at the expense of that critical critical lens as well um, so uh, but you know if you don't have a place in the curriculum you basically don't exist right so it's better to have media arts and to have that foothold and to have a curriculum written rather than just kind of disperse into nothingness. Um, so that's, that's the tension there often. Um, yeah. And the ACCC inquiry into the digital platforms recently, you know, that, that came out in 2019, two of its key recommendations, one of them was about media literacy education in the community and one was about media literacy, or they call it digital media literacy, um, needing, to be, uh, needing to be more visible within the Australian curriculum, essentially. So how ACARA manages to do that is, um, is a really interesting question. You want to say something, Anne? I just want to um, make a comment about that. And um, most recently, I've been speaking to scientists and medical um, public health communication specialists as well. And I think... Um, certainly for the adult population, what I'm seeing at the moment the need is is to really understand how scientists work and have a um, more of a science literacy as well in Australia. So I'm not sure how you bring that in. Um, I mean, that's what I'm observing that you know the adult population is is really needing at the moment because when you've got 
your statistics on AstraZeneca and blood clots, and then you see the messages that are out there and the doubt and the vaccine hesitancy. But if you actually understand how science works and how science um, you know, gets to its facts and things evolve over time, um, I think that would you know, go a lot for um, reducing the vaccine hesitancy and, the, and, and those problems that we're seeing and just um, you know, the headlines that, that are just constantly focusing on, oh, here's a death, here's a, here's a blood clot, here's a this. Um, it, it's, it really has to be um, attacked from a completely different angle, I think. Okay, we've probably got time for one last question from the audience, if, if someone has one. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Michael. Um, this is a question for Anne. I just wanted to know a little bit more uh, when you said you were adapting the Stony Brook um, curriculum in Asia. I think we've been talking a lot today about media literacies and replacing skills with values. Um, but that you know raises the question of whose values. Um, and I noticed, Manette, um, when you had the, the cube up there, that Indigenous knowledges and perspectives are included in that education. Um, but they're not in a lot of other discussions that we've been having around commercial platforms or you know journalism organizations so i was just wondering what your experience of you know tailoring and including um, asian perspectives in the content that you were delivering was like yeah um it it was first up it was basically taking out the first amendment in everything you know in all of the um different um materials and resources that were there and just really thinking about you know you think of Asia and there's just so much diversity there it's, it's not just one big place you know and and um, within each different um, country within each different region there's just so many complexities to what their lived experiences are um, you know you look at the um, the actions if you're taking Myanmar at the moment you know we've done work in Myanmar and if you look at um, there's the whole We've gone through the whole experience of when social networks were, I, I guess, um, you know, like Facebook first um, came on the scene there and people are needing that media literacy to understand, you know, what's happening in the online world and the effects that that can have in the offline world, you know, including, you know, people being killed because of what they're, of what they're seeing and how things can be manipulated. Um, it's, it's so complex because you're then looking at, well, what are the pressures that governments are putting on the platforms as well so you know at the moment there's a coup the first thing they do is they put pressure on the platforms they say or oh, anything against us that's a misinformation campaign or this is disinformation that's how they get their power um and so i think you know to be honest it puts the platforms in a very difficult position as well um with regards to what different governments um you know, are asking them to do. It puts people in danger when basically the internet gets turned off because governments aren't happy. Um, it, it's, it's a highly complex area, but I think the best we can do for the moment now is for the platforms to be as transparent as possible with, with what's happening um, and, of act, and as active as possible. Uh, but, I, but I think the main thing was, you know, for us in our experience, it was really just looking at um, you know, it, it would be completely, where are we? What is their reality here? Um, peel away, um, you know, the, the, the resources as we know them and make them actually applicable for here to do, to do the best with, with what we can um, in that area. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so I think we need to leave it there for our panel. Um, so I'd like you to join me in, in thanking the panel. Panelists. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, um, media literacy <clears throat> is asked to achieve a lot of different things, and I think we've seen in the in the conversation there that um, you know it w this is a complex area. Um, it's it's not like this this is an issue or a problem or something that's going to be uh, you know achieved or solved overnight. Um, it's something that frustrates me no end that, um, you know, governments will come along or sometimes the platforms will come along and say, here's our solution to media literacy. Do this set of activities and everyone will be media literate or more media literate. That's that's um, kind of, you know, um, one of the things we're trying to 
um, <clears throat> respond to, I suppose, in the research that we're doing as part of this project. Um, so after, after the next break, after afternoon tea, um, I'm going to share with you the findings of um, the research that we conducted, um, which was a survey of three and a half thousand adult Australians aged 18 to 80 plus. And um, it's, it's really the most comprehensive study of Australians and media literacy that's been conducted um, to date. And um, some of the findings are really quite interesting. So I hope you'll stick around uh, to hear some of that. Um, if you can't, then um, we'll be in touch with you um, to, to make sure you know the details of um, where you can find that report. But, um, but yeah, please do, um, do stick around if you can. So there's afternoon tea now for about uh, 25 minutes or so. And then at 2.30, we'll, we'll start the next section. So thank you again. Thank you.